Hi, I'm Brent Stafford, and this is RegWatch by RegulatorWatch.com. Stoptober is back, the UK's annual challenge to quit smoking in the month of October. According to the NHS, if a smoker can stay quit for 28 days, then it is five times more likely the person who quits will quit for good. Those are great odds, but what about how a smoker chooses to quit? Does that improve the odds of success as well? For years, UK government health organizations have been leading voices in support of vaping as a tool for tobacco harm reduction. Yet the UK is not immune to the massive worldwide campaign of misinformation intended to discredit and destroy vaping as a viable alternative to smoking. Joining us today from Leicester, England is Louise Ross, tobacco harm reduction advocate and clinical consultant. Louise, thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, and we have a lot to talk about in today's episode. I'd like to discuss the realities on the ground in the UK in their effort to stamp out smoking. And I'd like to address some tough questions like are e-cigarettes being promoted actually on the ground in NHS uh, Stop Smoking Services? And what is the current UK perception of vaping? And finally, how might the demise of Public Health England affect the outcome of the war on vaping? And for some of our viewers, what I just said there is going to be a shock. Yes, Public Health England is being scrapped. But first, tell our audience about your work with the Stop Smoking Services and fill us in on Stoptober. Thank you. Yes, uh, I wear a number of hats these days. So I do some work for the National Centre for Smoking Cessation and Training. Um, I'm business development manager for the Smoke Free app, which I can talk about later. Um, I do some freelance training. Uh, I was uh, a co um what were you, a co-presenter for the uh, Twitter Quit for COVID clinic over the summer months to help people, uh, you know, really get on board with the idea of, of, of improving their health by quitting. So lots of different things. And I, I still um, am vice chair of the New Nicotine Alliance as well. Yeah, so I mean, you were, I mean, you definitely have had your fingerprints all over this effort now for 16, <laughs> maybe 20 years? I think that's right, yes, yes. And then, and also with research too, like when, when we go through yes. some of the research articles, you've got your fingerprints on that too as well. Yes, yes. Um, other people do do all the real hard work and the heavy lifting. Um, I, I, um, I, I help where I can. And certainly when I was managing a stop smoking service, we were very, very proud to be part of the trial of e-cigarettes that Peter Hayek and the Queen Mary University of London um, team ran. Um, and, uh, you know, that is being quoted widely as evidence that vaping really does help people stop smoking. So with regard to all of the great news that over the years has come out of, excuse me, out of the UK, you've been a part of that group. Yes, I hope so. Yes. So. On the ground, you actually work with regular uh, uh is it British people? How do you, what's the right term for that? I had a total brain freeze there, but Brits, <laughs> Brits right. You work with, you work directly with Brits, real people on, on trying to quit smoking. It's, you're not at this lofty level, like you're on the ground. I'm certainly not lofty. I, I tend to support the team of advisors who are doing the, the, the talking with smokers. Um, I, I do have some contact with smokers, but generally I'm, I'm there behind the scenes supporting people to to get the message out in in the right way and and you know to give people choice uh not to you know take a one size fits all approach because obviously choice is really key to getting people successfully quit mm -hmm. so i've got uh, prepared for us here you were last on the show in march 2017 so a little you know over three and a half years ago yeah. so that's some time and yeah, a lot's happened since then. A lot has happened since then. I'd like to play just a, a short minute or so here from the start of our piece. This isn't with the interview with you. This is a setup where I contextualize some of the stuff that goes on with regard to smoking in England. And then we get into specifics about the Stop Smoking Services, uh, which you ran. Uh, one of them, as you said, for 16 years you worked there. And then, of course, with some of the research and guidance that had been come out by the National Health Service. So let's just have a quick listen to that. And let me just make sure that you can be okay with that. Here we go. Smoking has been an acute health issue in Britain for well over a half a century. At one point in the decades following World War II, 81% of men and 39% of British women were smokers. 
To combat the deeply entrenched habit, the English Department of Health set up the National Center for Smoking Cessation and Training to equip an army of healthcare workers with the skills needed to help smokers try to quit. It's a national effort executed through 150 locally controlled stop smoking service locations with staff dedicated to providing personalized counseling and behavioral support. In response to the sharp increase of e-cigarette use across England, the verifiable reports of successful quit attempts thanks to vaping, and the Public Health England report concluding that e-cigarettes are 95% less harmful than smoking, the National Centre issued a 45-page guide recommending the use of e-cigarettes in stop smoking treatment programs. While acknowledging there are still unknown long-term risks associated with vaping, the guide provides enthusiastic support for the use of e-cigarettes and stakes out a clear message concerning relative risk. The guide states, e-cigarettes are considerably safer than smoking, are a great deal safer than smoking, and are substantially less harmful than smoking. The guide also promotes the efficacy of vaping products, stating clients who combined e-cigarettes with behavioral support had the highest quit rates. These statements regarding relative risk of vaping versus smoking underpin public health policy in England and inform stop smoking practitioners in their work. So the question is, three and a half years later, how much did material like that and efforts like that actually inform uh, the people on the ground um, in England? I think it was very influential indeed. Um, the, the, the report by Public Health England, many uh, papers produced by uh, very eminent researchers with you know, international reputations, what the SCSCT brought out, all that combined to, to influence the direction of travel in terms of tobacco harm reduction in the UK. Um, I've been involved in updating the NCSCT guide so uh, we're about to publish the third um, edition of that. Um, the, the last one came out in 2016, so it's being updated. It's been a bit delayed because of COVID. Obviously, we've, we've got to get information about uh, the, the coronavirus in there uh, to make sure it's absolutely bang up to date. But that will be out very soon. And, you know, it's been sent around to stop smoking services, to general practitioners, uh, hospital care, um, healthcare workers. Um, uh, it's it's been uh, um, espoused by health charities as well. So you know we're we're very very proud to have that, that you know very considerable body of evidence uh, that can be used. So the guidance and, and you know the materials coming out of government you know do obviously appear to be very supportive of vaping, but yet though there is data that shows that the public perception of vaping in the UK is taking a nosedive, not, maybe yes. not as much as it has in the US and Canada, but it certainly has there. You know, explain that a little bit for us. It, it depends what people read and what their basic uh, prejudices are around, around vaping, about tobacco harm reduction, uh, an, an innovative, innovative way of, uh, of stopping smoking. And so there will always be some who want to only use the, the tried and tested traditional medicinal ways of stopping smoking. Uh, and they will say uh, to, to me and to others, you know, this has worked for years. Why not just stick with that? Um, and the, the answer is that it doesn't suit everybody. So many people have stopped smoking with, with nic nicotine replacement therapy, Champix and so on, uh, you know, the medicinal products. But a lot more have never, ever tried those and they've never tried vaping as well. And we, we want to make sure that that message is out there, that vaping is much safer than smoking. And that if you haven't tried it before, give it a go. And you might find, like many have, that this is, you know, this is a really good way of stopping smoking. Is support for vaping in danger in the UK? I, I think worldwide support for vaping is in danger. In some countries, it's much worse than others. Um, there's a new European Commission report being consulted on at the moment, but with, which has some terrible assumptions written into it about, um, you know, the fact that uh, it, it, you know, vaping itself may attract young people into smoking, that there's no evidence that it helps people stop smoking. The, these are opinions. It's not science. 
and and yet it will be presented as a, a scientific fact and the more noise there is and we, we know it's being funded by uh, anti-vaping activists uh, the, the more noise that's made about that the more people who who you know are on the fence and don't really know which side of the fence to jump will think there must be something in it no smoke without fire that sort of thing why is the issue why is the issue of e-cigarettes so fraught with po politics and ideology I, I wish i knew i i think the fact that it's it's not controlled by the pharmaceutical industry it's not owned by the medics that it's a consumer driven revolution um and across the world i suppose that the, the, there isn't the standardized regulation that that we have in in the uk you know, we've got very very good regulation in the uk to protect against things like the Bali crisis that, that hit the the us um but the, the fact that the, the media are there kind of stirring up stories the fact that there are researchers you know trying really hard to to find and prove harms where you know we we know it's most unlikely that there are harms um you know if you talk to consumers they almost inevitably say that they feel so much better when they've stopped smoking with vaping um but their their voice doesn't seem to count well, no, that is true. And I mean, if there's one thing that I want our viewers in North America to understand here is that, you know, vaping in the UK might not be the utopia or at least the solidified utopia that you hope, because this war on vaping last year at this time, just weeks after the Valley, uh, you know, lie, you know, came out and, and, and broke, I call it launched, right, when the national media launched it last year. Um, just weeks after that, Bloomberg came out with like a 4,000 word story that attacked the foundational science that supports vaping. And of course, much of that comes out of the UK. So they were attacking Public Health England by name, people that work at Public Health England, researchers in the UK, Dr. Pelosa, even in the US, they attacked researchers there too as well. So they went after the foundational science of vaping, and that was a year ago. So to yeah. think that they aren't going to go after the science of vaping today i think is short-sighted mm, mm. yes it, it will keep happening i'm afraid and um you know there's there's um a suggestion that you know denmark um you know there's consultation going on there at the moment you know and from what i hear um shisha which we know is is very harmful because of the smoke is likely to be um, you know, quietly ignored, while vaping, which which you know is comparatively much much safer than smoking, is is likely to be banned. Um, it's, it's it's speculation at the moment, but you know it's, it's that sort of thing that really really worries us. I mean, I. <laughs> so, it, is there an ethnicity or a religion that is closer, you know, with shisha than say vaping might be with just with general people like you know how do i ask this question i mean is there a political and cultural reason that the european union would look to exempt that i i have no idea it it simply doesn't make sense um it it tells me that people haven't looked deeply enough at the at the science behind this um that they're they're making suppositions and and this really isn't helpful so you know opinion is is masquerading as science mm. And I, I'm not a scientist. I, you know, I work with 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 people. I, I, you know, I try and help people stop smoking. So, you know, I'm perhaps not clever enough to to understand all the all the stuff that goes on at, at the research and scientific level. But, um, you know, when when you read reports and and you know and see people stating that that vaping will encourage children to start smoking, you know, we we know this is not true. There is it's being surveyed very very carefully in the uk and you know we know that there is no sign of never smokers going on to be um to be vape vapors or, or smokers you know because they started vaping in the first place yeah it is quite the little bit of a circle when it comes to the arguments that the anti-vaping forces make because it always comes back it just recycles it's you know flavors it's gateway mm. it's addiction it's just, it just keeps cycling 
And we definitely are in the gateway cycle. Let's take a, a look at some of the statistics that are out of um, the UK with regards to smoking prevalence. I've just got up here. These are 2019. Uh, these are the 2019 numbers, though they talk about, um, uh, in this case, you know, from 2011. And this is the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so adult smoking habits in the UK 2019. Smoking prevalence has fallen in all four countries of the UK since 2011. So that's pretty clear that there's been, you know, a drop. Mm -hmm. And then people aged 25 to 34 years continue to have the highest smoking prevalence. Can you talk about that for us a bit, Louise? Um, yes, we, we know that um, as, as people get older, they are more likely to stop smoking. Um, there are fewer younger people starting to smoke, but, you know, um, 10, 15 years ago, there were far more young teen smokers. So, you know, now they're, they're reaching the age of, you know, the young adults, uh, and they're very much the ones that the Stop Smoking Services we want to uh, address our message to. So Stop Sober particularly, you know, will be very, very much kind of... Um, sending out a message to those young adults saying, you know, now is a really good time, particularly as that's the age where people start having children. Uh, you know, we, we don't want to see children raised in a home where both parents smoke, if there's anything that we can, we can do to, to help that. Because uh, if, if a, a child yeah, is raised in a, a family where both parents smoke, they're much more likely to become smokers themselves. But I mean, when I started working in the stop smoking service, uh, in in my patch anyway, one in three adults smoke, um, and the figures that we've been talking about, uh, you know, just just today as Stoptober is about to launch, um, the the smoking prevalence is way way down now. Um, I think the figures that you were talking about earlier were about fourteen point one percent. Um, it's probably just a little bit less than that now. So, you know, that's that's a terrific drop. Part of that is due to, uh, you know, really, really good tobacco control measures. You know, we've got plain packaging, we've got um, uh, point of sale, um, you know, display bans, um, uh, plain packaging, that sort of thing. But, you know, the fact that we've been very encouraging as a country of, um, people using clean nicotine in the form of vaping has also had an effect. We know that it's, um, vaping has contributed thousands of extra quitters that wouldn't have um, quit without uh, using e-cigarettes. Yeah, great point too. And that goes, it speaks to the last two slides that I wanted to show. The proportion of smokers who have quit was at the highest level since 1974. So, you know, in 2019, we've got a lot of people in the UK that's quitting. And the numbers, as you had just said, from, from these stats were 14.1% of people aged 18 years and above smoke cigarettes in the UK, which equates to about 6.9 million smokers. And then, as you mentioned, there was some data that came out today that's now just edged down slightly, shaved to 13.9%. So, you know, definitely there's a, you know, this trend has been going on for some time. But definitely, e-cigarettes have played a role, at least historically in the UK. There are approximately 3 million vapors in Great Britain. In 2019, 5.7% of surveyed respondents reported they currently used an e-cigarette. They vaped. Significantly higher than observed in 2014. And, but what you take a look at that, what you do see, though, is a drop from 2018 to 2019, and when you see 2020, I can't imagine that that isn't, you know, more of a cliff drop. So we can see the real impact of the mendacious, you know, science in the mm -hmm. public, you know, in the, the public hysteria that's been generated. And that's obviously yeah. driving some vapors in the UK back to smoking. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of my former colleagues in the Stop Smoking Service that I used to run, she, she works in a hospital. She does a lot of training about how to stop smoking, the role of vaping. And when she when she delivers a, a training program, the staff are fascinated by how vaping could be an answer to, especially to their, their patients who've tried and tried so many different ways. And they, you know, they, they go off and 
you know, start, uh, you know, encouraging the patients to, to have a go at vaping. And then the next time she goes back, they've all changed their minds because they've read an article that, that says that, uh, you know, it, it will cause heart attacks, respiratory disease. Um, and they, they just see the article and, and think, well, it must have been wrong what they, what they learned before. So they start telling their patients it's dangerous and, you know, that they, they might as well go back to smoking in some cases. That's tragic. Um, mm. So how do you how do you combat that? Because you you and your colleagues are at this position where you're working with these people to educate them on their work with clients. It sounds like you know it's kind of trying to hold the the water back, you know, from the dam as it's bursting. It does feel like that sometimes, but um, you know we have got some very strong voices. The the royal colleges um, are very much you know with us on this. The Royal College of Midwifery, for instance, um, you know, supports what the NCSCT say about um, uh, vaping in pregnancy, that if a woman would have been smoking otherwise, but she's willing to vape, then that's a good thing and that should be encouraged. And, and the, the, um, the UK Challenge Group on Smoking and Pregnancy are, you know, very clear that, you know, a, a pregnant woman who is prepared to, to vape, to stop smoking, should be encouraged to do that and not put off, um, you know, that concept. So, so then, you know, having having got that high level leadership, it's important to get that training out to midwives so that they also reinforce that and they don't undermine the message by, you know, giving an opinion rather than fact. So I've got uh, the NHS's uh, page on e-cigarettes here, scrolling uh, by the screen, and so. Let's, you know, talk a little bit about this because the NHS, um, uh, certainly they, you know, got the pages, you know, Public Health England's got the pages that are there, but is it, how much does that really crack through to the public, you know, do, because in Canada, after the Valley uh, thing hit, um, Health Canada went out and purchased a whole bunch of Google search terms around vaping and so forth that would drive you directly to epidemic kind of uh, coverage that the Health Canada was putting up on the government website. So alternatively, you know, does Public Health England, and we're gonna talk about Public Health England, I'm gonna hold that to a little bit later in the show, very important issue, the fact that Public Health England's been scrapped. Yeah. Um, but before we get there, you know, does NHS, you know, buy Google search terms and stuff, so when people search for vaping, they get to the vaping e-cigarette page, which gives you all the great information. like. I'm, I'm trying to close the loop here with you a little bit. Like, are the last miles of the things that need to get done in order to connect the public to all of this very important real science on vaping, are those, are those connections being made or are things kind of stopping? You know, is, is the UK the utopia of e-cigarettes or does there's more need to get done? You know, is really trying to, I want to crack at yeah, it. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I think there are, uh, there are, um, pockets and even, you know, probably fields of really good practice. And then there are some areas where it's that simply not happening. So, um, you know, just a few miles um, away from where I'm sitting now, there are one, two, you know, several services that are actually giving out e-cigarettes to help people stop smoking. That is part of the service package that if somebody com comes along to see the stop smoking service and they want to use a vape, it will be given to them for free. Down in Northampton, um, a you know, very dear colleague of mine, Richard Holly, um, you know, has, has, has set up a, a, a similar program based on um, you know, what he's seen working in other areas, and they, they are going for it. They have given out a number of devices now since they started, um, lots of liquid, and you know, they're they're now reaping the rewards in terms of success. And yet, you know, you go up the up the M6 to uh, an area further north. I'm not going to mention the name of it, but their uh, their stop smoking service is trying to get people to stop using e-cigarettes. So if if somebody comes and they're using an e-cigarette, they will they will help them not use it. Um, that doesn't make sense to me. Hold, hold but, on, um, they will they will help people quit using e-cigarettes. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Which I think is, you know, a, a waste of our resources because, in fact, we we know that the longer people can stay vaping, 
the less likely it is that they will relapse to smoking. And not everybody will want to vape forever, but, you know, and, and they, they might come to the point themselves where they think, well, you know, I've had enough and they can, they can reduce their dose. They can, you know, finally get off themselves if they want to. It's not up to us to say, this is what you've got to do, because that, in that way, you kind of push people towards, you know, going back to smoking when the, the, the first time they hit a crisis uh, or somebody, you know, shoves a cigarette towards them. If they still had their vape in their hand, they wouldn't take that cigarette. So if you were to look at all the postal codes, and you said just prior to us uh, going live on the air that it's a postal code lottery. <laughs> it feels like that, that, you know, depending on where you live, um, you know, you will either get good advice on vaping or, or poor advice. And, you know, I've, I've spoken to, to people in some stop smoking services where, you know, they're, they're simply not allowed to, to talk positively about vaping. They're not allowed to, uh, to suggest it. They might use it as a, 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 a treatment of last resort, if you like. If somebody has tried all the patches, all the other NRTs, Champix, um, and failed with everything, then they might use, uh, use a vape instead. But again, the, the colleague I was telling you about earlier, you know, she will say, if you had somebody with, with diabetes, you wouldn't ask them to try a lot of different stuff that probably wouldn't work with them. You'd get them straight onto a proper, you know, a, a, you know, a regime using insulin or a, another specific medication that is right for that person. You wouldn't piss about, basically, on mm. something that isn't going to work. So, you know, if you think that that person, you know, could well succeed with vaping, don't make them go through all the NRTs first and then Champix and then say, well, all right, you failed with all of those. Let's now try vaping. Get them on, on vaping right to start with, especially if they're showing an interest in, in doing that. So uniquely to the UK, I believe, is that you've got these stop smoking services uh, centers, right? That exist. They're government funded. Um, correct. Uh, maybe yeah. some. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah. Right. It's I'm sure there's local money. Government. Not it's, central. It's, yeah, it's local government money. Right, which is hence why the uh, the education regime or the treatment regime or whatever you want is subject to local whim. Yeah. Right. Yes. So if you were to look at the total number, and I, we had 150 in the in the piece from three and a half years ago. So you know, let's just use that for the sake of an argument. Out of out of that, what percentage do you think are e-cigarette friendly? I I wouldn't like to hazard a guess actually. Um, and there are there are a number of ways you can you can cut this. Um, some will say that they are e-cig friendly, but actually uh, it's a bit lip service ish. Um, that you know that they may tolerate the idea of uh, of using a vape, but not actually recommend it. Others, you know, like the examples I gave earlier, you know, will actually give a device to help somebody, uh, you know, get started on vaping. So, so there's all sorts of shades of grey in here. Um, but it, it it is looked at at Public Health England um, and other bodies such as uh, Action on Smoking and Health. Uh, do survey this sort of thing um, and try and get some sort of standardization. You know, training materials are put out. Ash do a regular uh, briefing on e-cigarettes and, you know, we, we publicize this widely to try and get this message out that, that actually, you know, vaping is a really good alternative to, to smoking and can, and can make sure that people transition completely away from the smoked cigarette. And that's so, what's happening with Stoptober. Um, right. Um, tomorrow is the launch of the, uh, you know, the uh, the month of, of Stoptober, where uh, people are encouraged to uh, all get together um, and, and do this mass quitting event. Thank you for the uh, for the imagery. That's really nice. It's a it's a lovely lovely image. I think this year, um, you know, it, it really focuses on the fact that this is about lung health. And, and Stoptober this year will be very different, you know, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, a respiratory disorder. So, you know, we, we very much want people to understand that stopping smoking is so good to, you know, to protect their lung health. 
Has uh, PHE uh, NHS taken you know position with regards to some of the controversy around whether or not there's a benefit uh, with the research and stuff that's come out with, with regard to nicotine? It's it's being uh, examined very very closely and updated regularly. So there's a, a, a live evidence review going on and publishing very frequently. Right at the start of the pandemic, um, there was some suggestion and speculation that, that smoking in some way might confer uh, some kind of protection from COVID. And what the evidence reviewers found was that often people simply weren't asked if they were smokers anyway. Um, some people were recorded as, as ex-smokers because they said they had stopped smoking because they got ill. So they started showing symptoms. Uh, they were recorded as, as non-smokers. Uh, it, it, it was very, very messy. What we do know is that um, if, you, if you smoke, you are much more likely to suffer more severely from any respiratory disorder. So, you know, this is why we're, we're strongly encouraging people to, you know, to quit the COVID, to, to give themselves that protection. Um, you know, we know that smoking harms your immune system. There's all sorts of reasons why it's a very good idea to, uh, you know, to quit during this pandemic. And people are, are willing to do all sorts of things to protect themselves, protect their health. Um, we know this, you know, the, the hand washing, the, the, the distancing, the wearing masks and things like that. So stopping smoking is a, a very logical step to take uh, and it will protect people's lungs. Right, right. And that's sound, that's sound advice. Um, let's talk and, about and stop. Some, I'll, I'll just add as well, though, there is, there is some suggestion that nicotine itself could be a protective um, have a, a protective effect. And there's some research going on in Paris at the moment about this. Um, again, it's speculative. But what I would say is that if anybody um, wants to stop smoking, then it's a really good reason to, or a, additional reason to add um, clean nicotine to your quit attempt. So whether it's through nicotine replacement therapy or vaping, you know, getting that nicotine will, will increase the success um, over you know, going cold turkey or, or doing with it without any products at all. So how big of a role, you know, is e-cigarettes and vaping playing in the Stoptober campaign? So I just scrolled through a large, you know, uh, Stoptober page about 10 minutes ago, and I'm just going to throw this, the short little e-cigarette mention, uh, which, which is on the Stoptober page. It doesn't seem like it's really being called out as, you know, heralded as, uh, you know, grand savior of uh, smokers it's definitely there and uh i've i've, I've got my notes uh from from earlier because i was doing a pre-record um, ready for release tomorrow um and um most definitely uh vaping is one of the options i mean that there is a um a, a, a personal quit plan um that you can get and i think it's probably on your screen nearly on your screen um yes there we are about but, I mean, that's not the only mention, uh, what's, what's on your screen there. But um, uh, looking at, at the different products that you can use uh, for quitting smoking, the NRTs there, Champix, and e-cigarettes as well. Right. And then, so uh, the NHS also has uh, this Stoptober app, and I want to quickly talk about that and then jump to your app, because there's an app that you represent, and so that's I want you to right. explain the differences. So. Let's just go into uh, the app discussion. Okay, then. All right. So the we're, we're very much encouraging people to, to download the Stoptober app um, because that links with all the other messages um, on the, you know, the, the Stoptober Facebook page, the website and so on. So there's synchronicity there. Um, but it's... Uh, it's it's automated stuff. So you know you 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 look for um, you know the automated features and it'll it'll tell you useful stuff. The the app that I represent um, it's called Smoke Free. So two words and on the uh, the app store um, you look for the green heart and thank you. You've got some some nice images coming up there. The difference um, is that it's it's been developed over many years. Um, it's had over 
5 million downloads, um, over 150,000 five-star reviews, and it's got a number of features that are uh, uh, artificial intelligence based. Um, uh, yes, you know, see how much money you've saved. And, and, and most smoke free apps will do that. The, the extra stuff is um, tasks that are set for smokers. Um, so, so missions, um, there's a diary that you can, you can add your, your cravings to, um, targets, you know, things that you might want to save for. And the, the, the bit that I'm most involved with is the expert advisor team. So every day, 24 hours a day, there is somebody available to actually give you live advice on, on your quit attempt. So if, if somebody is struggling with, with cravings, uh, suffering side effects, uh, not sure what medication to use, want more information about vaping, there's always somebody there that they can talk to about it. And there's no limit to how many times they can use the advisors as well. So, you know, say you've got a pregnant woman and, and she's vaping. Uh, it's, it's one o'clock in the morning, she can't sleep and she's worried about her pregnancy. Uh, she, she wants to stop smoking, but she's finding it really difficult. She can reach out to an advisor and get live advice on how to manage that. So it's it's a big, big package of, a, of an app. And I'm very, very proud to, to work on it. And that was a great explanation. It looks good. You charge for the smoke free app. It does have a charge and you were explaining it was explaining that on the site. It, it is commercial. Uh, there's a free version so you can get, you know, um, the health benefits, uh, how the health benefits accrue, you know, pulse rate and blood pressure and that sort of thing, uh, savings, uh, how many minutes not that you haven't smoked that sort of thing um but uh in 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 uk money it's seven pound a month for the pro version so people can access the advisors and the rest of it for less than the cost of a packet of cigarettes a month and of course you know people won't necessarily need to use it for more than a few months we hope that people will will use it stop smoking not need to use it anymore we don't want them uh you know to to keep failing and um you know we, we want them to succeed and, and we give them huge amount of encouragement to succeed but it's it's international as well so we have users in in canada america south america india um australia and new zealand right across the world that's great <clears throat> that is great news Okay, so let's jump into the real bad news. <laughs> I mean, I can't have good news for too long, Louise. You know, this has, this is, you know, we are, we are news too. So of course, we have to talk Absolutely, about bad news. Yes, yes. So um, many people don't know about this, and that is in the summer, um, the British government scrapped Public Health England, <laughs> did away with it. Here's a bit of curious. It, it hasn't been. It hasn't been scrapped. Um, it's. It's. Um, its its future is undecided. I think that's possibly the best way of putting it. So it's business as usual. Um, certainly until the the end of March, um, you know, public health will, will be working as hard as it's ever worked. Um, you know, certainly on tobacco control. There's some great people in the team, and you know, it will be business as usual. So that that's uh, that sounds like some good news then. So what I've got <laughs> from our curated headlines here is. Public Health England has to be had to be scrapped. Uh, Britain's government axes Public Health England. Public Health England scrapped as government creates National Institute for Health Protection. The Guardian view on scrapping Public Health England, not just wrong, but highly risky. Why yeah. is Public Health England being scrapped and <laughs> we'll replace yeah. it? So maybe it's my bias for what I was picking there, but these were the, you know, the main pieces that were coming out at the time. So no, explain you, to our viewers who have not heard this news what this is referring to. And, and, mm -hmm. and granted, you know, I'm, we're, I'm not trying to like, you know, raise an alarm that, you know, they're gone right now as it is, but certainly some, something has happened here. Yeah, and, and many of us are very concerned about this. You're absolutely right. Um, I, I just didn't want anybody to think that, that you know, Martin Dockerell and his team have, have simply stopped working. They are still working very, very hard and being supported by, um, you know, all the, um, of the charities uh, and the Royal Colleges in, uh, in the UK that are, are very concerned about smoking. So Public Health England in its entirety 
deals with both communicable and um, non-communicable diseases, health protection, health improvement, and, and other healthcare issues. What the government have done is plan to split the functions and make this new National Institute for Health Protection, which will deal with the communicable diseases, which are, are seen to be the, the big crisis at the moment. What we're concerned about is that there's been no statement about what will happen with the non-communicable diseases. Now, Linda Bold, who um, you had on your, your programme not so long ago, said in a webinar on Monday that um, that we've got a situation of a, a syndemic, so the, a synergistic action of, of the, the pandemic and the non-communicable diseases. So tobacco use, alcohol use um, and obesity all coming together as a crisis that will widen the health inequalities gap. So as you know, after lockdown, people were maybe not going out as much, not exercising as much, eating more, uh, drinking more, smoking more. Um, a certain section of, of, of our population were anyway. Um, and we need to make sure that whatever the government bring out as a, an alternative to the, the function of dealing with the non-communicable diseases, um, you know, the, the, the things that are caused by smoking, for example, you know, that they are really strong that they're not just sort of like marginalised. It needs investment. Um, it needs you know good data. It needs the, the, the right experts. And you know I must say that this government haven't got a great record in putting the right experts into the jobs where they you know they need to do a good job. So we very much want to see the right people you know maintained and and put into whatever the new body is. Apparently, there's going to be some announcement in October about what the, the shape of the, the health improvement um, body, whatever it is, going forward will be. But, you know, only vague statements have been made at the moment. Now, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in this. This is just what I have learned from, from you know, listening to others. Um, so, you know, we, we've got a lot of work to do. As a, as a country and as, um, you know, people that are involved in, uh, you know, tobacco management and tobacco harm re reduction as well, to get the right uh, messages going forward. It's, as, as you say, it's a huge risk. If, if that expertise was lost and the, the passion for tobacco harm reduction was lost, we'd be in a right pickle. Yeah, and that's really what I'm trying to get at as a sense yeah. of, a sense of that, right? I mean, it it this action, while it's not been directed, you know, I assume, of course, from what I read and what you've just said, it's not been directed at the non-communicable diseases side. Um, though I do believe, though, in the UK, there has been a fairly decent pushback on the nanny state and and the nudging philosophy that Public Health England might have on some of the obesity issues and and food and and everything else. Chris Snowden, Christopher Snowden, obviously, has been a big critic. Um, along those lines. So, f you know, fair enough. Um, but, you know, from a practical position for those in North America and the rest of the world that live outside of the UK orbit, they routinely use Public Health England in the 95% figure as the lifeline, you know, is the, is, is the nuclear weapon, if so, if I could use it in that manner, it's the only thing they got, really, is Public Health England. That's what vaping advocates have, and they consistently mention it. And I just wonder what happens if Public Health England as an organization goes away, the name no longer, it's now defunct. So the defunct Public Health England, so all vaping, uh, a force, anti-vaping forces will have to do is just go, oh, what do you mean? The 95% figure from the defunct, now defunct Public Health England? Like you can't even quote it. If the organization doesn't exist anymore, if the organization was disbanded, um, it, regardless if it has anything to do with it, it almost makes it very difficult to, hard, you know, you can't harden that, that, uh, that stat anymore. I, th I think it's important to emphasize that there are other bodies that, um, you know, that, that, that contributed to, to that assessment on comparative harm. So, you know, we, we still have, you know, very strong voices um, from uh, Action on Smoking and Health, 
uh, the Royal College of Physicians, uh, UC UCL, you know, University College London, and you know many of the other universities where there's a strong tobacco research element. Um, and so, whatever the new um, brand is for for health improvement from a, a you know a, a national NHS perspective, you know, we still have those other bodies. You know, also uh, Cancer Research UK as well, of course. You know that, that there are there are many you know very authoritative voices there that will continue to um, you know to press for uh, a, a, a sensible approach to tobacco harm reduction. Sure. Yeah. No. For sure. And let this be a call out that that other organizations are going to have to step up and put out some you know yeah. some stuff because would you not agree? that from a practical communications point of view, it does make it difficult to hold on to that once Public Health England is no longer Public Health England. It's, it's, it's one of the risks, and, and I think we're, we're very aware of that in, 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 in our world mm. and, and are concerned about it. Well, I'll let this be the warning call then, the shot across the bow to all the North American vaping advocates out there to start thinking about this, because at some point, Utilizing that stat connected to Public Health England will will not have the same strength as it does now when the organization does not you know no longer exists. And you make the good point that there's a lot of individuals and professionals that are, you know are involved in all those organizations. But the the great thing about Public Health England was that you know it resonated as you know uh, as a national organization of experts, and mm -hmm. so it made it you know in its collectivized sense uh, very strong. Um, because individuals can be attacked for their scientific position, whereas it's much harder to attack an entire agency that's responsible for public health. Yes. I mean, having said that, though, you know, in the last um, 10, 20 years, there have been many reorganizations in the, the National Health Service, in, in central government, local government. So, um, you know, we, we we tend to have to move on and, you know, learn new new acronyms, new titles, new reports are, are brought out. Um, and, you know, it, this, that becomes the, the, the current reality. Uh, we have to maintain our optimism about the future. And optimism is great. Um, I'm a bit of a pessimist these days because watching <laughs> what's happening in the U.S. Yeah. Um, is, you know, yeah. is, is drastic. And... Canada's slipping. Um, Nova Scotia is, you know, essentially banned vaping. They've gone as far as they can without banning it. PEI is looking at flavor bans and so forth. We've got, you know, draconian regulations coming out in other provinces. And I'm hope we're hoping things might get a little bit sorted out in British Columbia. But either way, it's a piecework, patchwork, mm -hmm. you know, regulatory process in a country that was the first in the Western world to legalize vaping. So yeah. we're falling apart. And, and UK, I'm just wondering, and I don't want to be pessimist, but I want to be a realist. I, 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 if, if you were to ask me, do I, am I trying to burst vapors bubbles with regards to their utopian view of the UK? My answer is yes, because if the UK is getting soft, if some of the support is waning or was not as strong as we always thought it was at the ground level, I want us talking about that because, you know, pe people need to ne need to get hardened here. And, and, mm. and utopian thinking is not hardened. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, so I my question is, so my question is, I mean, how, is it softening? Is the enthusiasm in the UK for vaping softening, do you think? I, I don't believe so, no. I, I really don't believe so. And I think partly that's because the evidence grows year on year that, um, that more and more people have actually stopped smoking because they have gone on to vaping. Uh, and Robert West's um, smoking toolkits study, um, now Jamie Brown's <laughs> um, smoking toolkits, can't get the words out tonight, smoking toolkit study, you know, will demonstrate that. It does demonstrate it month on month on month. Um, and, you know, when you've got a very very solid evidence base like that and you know when you've got universities and new researchers as well you know the young young researchers doing a lot of work you know demonstrating that you know flavors are popular they they make a difference that young people aren't um starting to vape 
that you know warning messages on packets you know that there should be a, a, a comparative um aspect you know this a risk um risk comparative uh, aspect to the warning uh you know that it makes a difference to whether people are, are willing to try vaping if the if the message is, is more nuanced that sort of thing you know th th there's a lot of people working on this and we need to make sure that you know there is plenty of that and less of the other stuff yeah i've got the phe uh 2020 update here just scrolling a little bit because I mean, it's fantastic the work that's come out of England. I mean, it, it's been amazing. We herald it all the time for years now, and we just want to make sure that you know that we can find a way to support that somehow. I mean, yeah. you know, it's hard for me to really articulate the concern that I've got. Yeah. And I'm trying to voice on behalf of the rest of everybody else in the world, going, "Wait, what can we do? Like, we're you know, if I we know. lose, if we lose the UK, we're we're screwed, right?" <laughs> and what we need to do as well is to make sure that the consumers' voices are mobilised as well. You know, there are some really, really good consumer organisations and, you know, they need to be linking up. You know, the, the, the European Tobacco Harm Reduction Association, you know, it, it was a, their first birthday this week. And, you know, across Europe, lots of little organisations and some big organisations of consumers all working together to 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 put in uh, objections um uh, you know views to to consultations that sort of thing you know that that must be happening uh in in U the uk in europe canada america really important to mobilize the consumer voice and let's uh let's uh, tackle this we've got a few minutes left um to dance around some of these issues here and, and one of them being is is explain the tpd for a North American uh, audience and what's happening now with it, because that's a part of all this consultation that's going on as a revamping of the regulations across Europe. Right. You're probably asking the wrong person. Okay. Um, it's, it's, it's that sort of thing is Clive Bates's uh, expertise. Um, I, I'm not clever enough to be able to kind of <laughs> encapsulate that. Certainly we have the, the tobacco products directives so regulations that affect um, Europe, including the UK, despite the fact that we've we've come out, um, it's it's being reviewed at the moment, uh, and yeah, it could go in all sorts of different ways. There are worries that you know that countries may go for gold plating, and you know make make the the rules even more stringent than they were before. Um, you know that that things like the you know the the uh, the strength and the you know the bottle size will 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 stay instead of being made more more relaxed. Um, I, I would simply urge any consumer uh, who is interested in in you know their future ability to be able to you know to vape legally to, to, to you know to use flavors and so on. You know, makes their voice heard. It's just really important. You know, listen to your consumer organisations, and you know, when when you're asked to kind of contribute a view, do it. So, okay. So I'm feeling a lot better about the future of vaping in the UK, which makes me feel a heck of a lot better about the future of vaping in North America. In terms of your mind, let's put the rose on it then. I mean, you know, let's put the sunshine view on it. Why should we be looking forward to, you know, more pro-vaping positions coming out of the UK? I suppose before I answer that, we've got to think about what's happening in America, uh, in, in the United States. And there's, there's a big, big risk there, isn't there? Yeah. Um, we, we, you know, and it's not for me to comment on, you know, the, the, the likely outcome of the, of the USA elections, but we know that if the Democrats win, they, they tend to be very anti-tobacco harm reduction. And, you know, that is, that is a concern, but, you know, if they, if they don't win, the, the, there's a whole other, um, load of stuff that, you know, that is severely under threat. You know, I'm 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 not trying to you know do any kind of political punditry here, but I'm 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 very concerned about 
um, you know, how the freedom of, of US citizens to vote will be affected by the election, whichever way it goes. I mean, it's astonishing, though. I mean, you might not want to get political, but it was already made political without, you know, you or me getting involved from a political point of view. It's just the realities on the ground in the U.S. Yeah. especially is it's a political issue. Yeah. Why is it that um, I was going to ask you this because, you know, the, the postal codes, the postal code lottery in the U.K., so, you know, certain number of uh, uh, areas are not supportive of, of vaping in the U.K. Can you make the same political uh, distinctions like, you know, is it a left right issue? Places that are a little more center, center left or, or, you know, more democratic, so to speak, liberal in the U.K. They happen to be the places that are, are anti vaping more than the others. No, I, I think it comes down to personal um, personal prejudice, personal views, a willingness to to be open and listen to to the arguments. And and I'm I'm aware of, you know, some local government leaders who started off very, very anti, you know, thinking that vaping was controlled by big tobacco, for instance, that, you know, it's it's all a plot to get young people vape, uh, vaping and smoking. Um, but they've listened to to the evidence. They've 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 listened to consumers, to to people who know what they're talking about, um, and they have changed their minds. Um, so a lot of it comes down to whether they've got you know ears open or ears shut. So you mentioned the U.S. Then I mean, how you know what? Why is what happens in the U.S. then a danger in terms of which way it goes? I think it's about loudest voices. And so, you know, what the US does will influence many, many of the smaller countries, especially the low and middle income countries. They will look at what happens in America and, you know, they will follow suit. The WHO as well will will influence that. And we know their take on, on vaping. They, uh, you know, they, they are very, very hostile to the idea of vaping. And this is highly influential as well. Um, so yes, the you asked me earlier to put a, um, a a final positive spin on on things. When you when you look at the global picture, it is very difficult to do that. And you know, I I believe we are we are fighting our corner very very fiercely. I hope um, you know I I hope that we. We continue to be able to do that, and and that you know that those voices aren't swamped by, you know, other louder voices. So let's take over the WHO. <laughs> well, Louise, look, thank you so much for coming back on the show. Uh, you know, I think there's you got to find the measure between positive and rosy view and realities yeah. on the ground. And I really wanted this episode to deal with the reality. So thank you very much for going there. Thank you very much for having me. It was a great pleasure. Really appreciate that. Well, and that is it. Just stay right there. And that is it for this edition of Reg Watch. Before you head off, please go over to support.regulatorwatch.com. That's support.regulatorwatch.com. And consider a monthly contribution to Reg Watch and our vaping coverage. We definitely need it. And you will appreciate it. And we love spending other people's money because we're government. No, anyhow. Well, that is it. And thank you very much. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. For RegulatorWatch.com, I'm Brent Stafford.